We begin today's show in Western Massachusetts, where a judge ruled Thursday a panel on Palestinian rights can move forward. Three anonymous UMass students filed a lawsuit to stop the event, claiming they will, quote, suffer irreparable harm if it takes place. But Judge Robert Ullman ruled Thursday the event can proceed, saying, quote, there's nothing that comes even close to a threat of harm or incitement to violence or lawlessness. Meanwhile, the university has backed the event, despite the protests, saying it's committed to the principles of free speech and academic freedom. Welcome to the University of Massachusetts Fine Arts Center. In the event of an alarm, please remain calm and leave the building. At this time, please turn off all mobile devices out of consideration for those on the stage and your fellow audience members. The use of cameras and recording devices is strictly prohibited. Thank you. Israel isn't supposed to defend itself. Oh, yeah, Mexico bombed Texas will be exercised. What other countries held to the same standard as Israel? Israel. 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 I am now not only a self-hating Jew, but they also call me an anti-Semite. How I, with my four Jewish grandparents, I'm still an anti-Semite. My wife was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany, and I'm an anti-Semite. They have, for a very long time, been able to effectively defend the indefensible uh, to the American public through miseducation and misinformation campaigns, through uh, smearing individuals on the opposite uh, side of things, labeling them all kinds of things, sympathizers with terrorism. I've done uh, dozens of interviews which begin from the terrorism departure point. But when given an opportunity to actually speak and present a different perspective, that can dissolve rather quickly. Is Hamas a terrorist organization? Do I get to actually speak now? At you get this to point? answer the question. It's a simple yes or no question. Is Sir, Hamas. I, you invited me on here. Is Hamas, whose charter calls for the destruction of Israel, is that a terrorist organization? That's a yes or no thank, question. Thank you for your question. Finally. It's very telling to me that, and it should be telling to your viewers as well, by the way, that the moment you have a Palestinian voice on your program who begins to explain the legitimate grievances of Palestinians Islam on the ground, a not just organization. Hamas. Answer. Sir, let me, sir, Answer let the me question. Finish. What part of this can you get through your thick head? I think Is I, Hamas a terrorist excuse me? organization? Excuse yes me? Yes or no? The only thing that you're going to say is what we want you to say. And if you don't say it, we're not going to let you speak. It's almost impossible to get any view that isn't one way or another shaped by an Israeli perspective. Almost impossible. It cannot get in without facing a firestorm of pit bull attacks to make sure that the line is followed. Everyone who's trying to tell the American public a different side of the story, um, an alternative view of the conflict that's uh, reality-based, has already crossed a barrier of fear. And I think they've already told themselves, well, I'm going to pay for this, but I'm ready to pay the price. For years, Minnesota Democrat Ilhan Omar has criticized Israeli policies. As a candidate, she argued that criticism was not the same as criticism of Jews. I see there being a difference between criticism of a country, criticism of its administration and its government, and criticism of the people and their faith. 
I am Jewish. I have fought against anti-Semitism my entire life, and I do not see anything in what Representative Omar said that is anti-Semitic. If anything, she's a truth teller. And to me, it's much less about what she said than who is saying it. This is a black, young woman, immigrant Muslim in Congress who's wearing a hijab, and they are going after her for that very reason. Omar wears a hijab. Is her adherence to this Islamic doctrine indicative of her adherence to Sharia law? The problem is that her beliefs are deeply rooted in hatred and anti-Semitism. She is a hater. I'm going to say it. She is filth. Jeff, that is a very strong word that you used. Yes. You know? She is a filthy, disgusting hater. Tonight we examine the pernicious influence in American politics of this woman, Linda Sarsour. A woman described by the New York Times very affectionately as a homegirl in a hijab. Just a few weeks ago on Facebook, she slammed folks who masquerade as progressives but always choose their allegiance to Israel over their commitment to democracy and free speech. Linda Sarsour, she's a professional activist. She's the child of Palestinian immigrants. You would think that she'd be grateful for the opportunities this country has given her family, especially considering where they came from. But no, Linda Sarsour is not grateful. She hates our country and the people who founded it. Today, some good news. CNN dump contributor Mark Lamont Hill. Obviously, Mark Lamont Hill, Sean, had to be fired in this situation. Uh, you mentioned it before, free Palestine from the river to the sea. That's right out of a Hamas script. You know, I've debated him uh, on CNN, and he is a bigot, and he is an anti-Semite, and uh, he never should have been on any network show. Uh, he shouldn't be teaching at a major uh, university. Uh, he is virulently anti-American, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel and anti-Western values in, in general. He's just a terrible, terrible human being. Is it a rock concert or a political platform or both? The summer tour by Roger Waters, formerly of Pink Floyd. The Greater Miami Jewish Federation took out an ad in the Miami Herald protesting his appearance, which read, anti-Semitism and hatred are not welcome in Miami. Waters says his criticisms are political. They're not religious. He has drawn ire as a supporter of Israel BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. He has lobbied performers not to perform in Israel and has regarded the Israeli treatment of Palestinians as apartheid. The guy from Pink Floyd is a big yap. You ought to shut his mouth too, Roger. We know Roger, I love Pink Floyd, but that's where it ends. Good evening, everyone. I am Satya Ali, Professor of Communication at UMass. And an Executive Director of the Media Education Foundation, the organizer of this event. What you have just seen in this montage is what happens when people dare to speak out about the Palestinian people as human beings, worthy of the same rights and dignity as everyone else. They are drowned out under an avalanche of slanderous and shameful lies that they are anti-Semites who hate Jews. In fact, when we started to publicize this event, conceived as a way to address the difficulties of talking about the legitimate demands of the Palestinian people, we started to see the same things happening to us. Our panelists have been casually accused of being anti-Semitic, and there have been loud calls to actually cancel the event. The specific genesis for the event tonight came from the firing of one of our panelists, Mark Lamont Hill, from CNN for his comments at the United Nations about the denial of human rights of the Palestinian people. I reached out to him um, to about coming here to discuss the case. And very quickly, events began to overtake us. First, an award uh, to Angela Davis by the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute was rescinded because of a support for the Palestinian people. And then, of course, as you've just seen, there was the firestorm of abuse and death threats rained upon Representative Ilhan Omar for daring to accurately describe the reality of AIPAC's influence on American politics, something that AIPAC itself proudly boasts about in its promotional materials. So I started to reach out to the other people on our distinguished panel. I had hopes, I did have hopes of one other person to join us, uh, the famed Palestinian legislator, Hanar Nishrawi, who after visiting the United States for decades, 
was suddenly unable to obtain a visa from the Trump administration. I hope you will ask why her important voice as an elected representative of the Palestinian people has been silenced from the discussion we will have tonight. Indeed, why was Omar Barghouti, the co-founder of the BDS movement, also denied a visa to speak in the US? Similarly, there have been attempts to silence the voices of our panel and this event. As one journalist described it in a headline, Israel supporters try to shut down UMass Forum about efforts by Israel supporters to shut down debate. <laughs> it, the irony is just that like, you don't even have to comment on it. I have been told that scores of calls have come into the university administration protesting tonight's gathering. The State Republican Jewish Committee and the State Republican Party have called on the university to cancel the event. A letter to the Chancellor signed by 80 right-wing pro-Israel organizations, including the Zionist Organization of America, uh, the American Jewish Council, and the World Jewish Council, uh, protested the event and wanted the university to disassociate itself from it, demanding that the three departments who originally co-sponsored, the Departments of Communication, of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, and the Resistance Studies Initiative, demanding that they withdraw their sponsorship. The university, specifically the chancellor, held firm to the principles of academic freedom uh, and said that departments had the right to sponsor events on the most important issues of the day. That, in the words of Chancellor Subhaswamy, quote, promoting the free exchange of ideas is one of the most important functions of the university. Further, as an act of solidarity against this intimidation by these reactionary outside groups, actually in some internal ones as well, and in defense of academic freedom and free speech, a number of other departments have subsequently joined the list of sponsors. The departments of anthropology, sociology, philosophy, health promotion and, po and policy, and STEPEC, the social thought and political economy program, have all come on board, and I am very grateful for their support. I know that there was also very vigorous debate and discussion in a number of other departments about whether to support the event. In fact, I think it's safe to say that very few events in recent UMass history have garnered as much attention and argument as this one. <laughs> So the event actually has already served its prime, primary function, to stimulate talk, to stimulate talk about the way in which discussion of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is severely curtailed. Finally, I thought that wasn't enough, there was also a lawsuit filed by a lawyer who's affiliated with another right-wing organization, Americans for Peace and Tolerance a group of Islamophobic reactionaries. I love the names, right? <laughs> uh, to force the university to cancel this event. The injunction, of course, was thrown out, laughed out of court, actually, on Thursday. As everyone knew that it would be, even the people bringing it knew it would be thrown out of court. Yes, yes. That allowed this event to proceed. But if the injunction was not really about stopping this event, why did they spend the thousands of dollars on it? And the answer is pretty clear. It was not about this event. It was about the next one that may be planned by some other group. It was an act of intimidation and bullying about the future. I want to close by thanking everyone at UMass and throughout the Valley who's reached out to me and my colleagues at the Media Education Foundation over the past couple of weeks to express their support for this event. I also want to say a special thank you to members of Students for Justice in Palestine at UMass. For helping to promote this event under very difficult circumstances. 
I'm also very grateful to the members of Jewish Voice for Peace Western Mass. Espe especially, especially Rachel Weber of JVP, who went to court, actually went to court for us and helped defeat the motion to stop this event by making an impassioned argument about the dangers of watering down the dangers of actual anti-Semitism by conflating it with criticism of Israeli repression. I also want to acknowledge the staff of the Fine Arts Center. They have been uh, fantastic, as has the entire team working behind the scenes to pull this event off. Finally, I want to thank the entire staff of the Media Education Foundation for all, the work on this, on the, all their work on this event, especially David Mello for his technical support, and especially Loretta Alper and Jeremy Earp, who have put countless hours into, making, into managing the details of this event. Our main work at the Media Education Foundation actually isn't putting on events, although you would never know it from tonight. <laughs> It's actually making movies. And a couple of years ago, we made a movie about the kinds of efforts we've seen over the past few weeks to silence pro-Palestinian voices and shape and distort how Americans understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's called The Occupation of the American Mind. And it lays out the different ways, and it lays out the different ways and different forces and interests that have worked to shut down debate, silence dissent, confuse the issues and conceal the reality of what Palestinian life is life living under Israeli military occupation. But even more importantly than that, our film shows that things are shifting as more and more people, especially young Palestinians and Jews who are joining in coalition with allies in the black liberation struggle to demand justice, are starting to see through these intimidation tactics and refusing to back down. What the resulting desperation, the phone calls, the letters, the lawsuits reveal to me is that the right are scared. They are petrified of these positive changes taking place in the culture. In that spirit of renewed hope, before we bring out our moderator and our panelists, I want to share a short clip from the conclusion of the occupation of the American mind narrated by Roger Waters that speaks to this historic moment. Over just the past few years, the proliferation of social media and internet news sources has made it increasingly difficult for the Israeli government and pro-Israel groups in the US to manage American perceptions of the conflict. Video footage and reporting from the ground bearing witness to the reality of the occupation are now more accessible than ever on the internet. In addition, over the past few years, a number of high-profile documentaries made by Israeli and Palestinian filmmakers alike have trained a harsh light on current Israeli policy and the repression of Palestinian rights. <laughs> كل أحد من الخام يودي هذه أدمات شل بالعين. أتم كنابتم أدمات شلو. شلانو. At the same time, a powerful new boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement has been gaining momentum and raising awareness of the occupation. While activists from the Black Lives Matter movement have been making explicit connections between police violence against African Americans. And the Israeli military's repression of Palestinians. We stand next to people who continue to courageously struggle and resist the occupation. People continue to dream and fight for freedom. From Ferguson to Palestine, the struggle for freedom continues. And all of these developments seem to be having an effect. Polls now show that while sympathy for Israel remains at all-time highs among older Americans, it has been hemorrhaging among young people. Despite the efforts of the lobby, something really striking is taking place. Lots of young people are abandoning the mainstream media and turning instead to other independent sources. So they have a totally different way of making sense of what's happening. 
an unfiltered view of Israel's repression. And pro-Israel operatives like Frank Luntz are in a panic. In his latest report, he calls what's happening with young people a disaster and demands that Israel's supporters respond. And people have answered the call. You have powerful right-wing billionaires like Sheldon Adelson, a major donor to Republican candidates, bankrolling a campaign to silence and intimidate student activists on college campuses. But it's not working. Groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, who see what's happening to Palestinians as a civil rights issue, have refused to be intimidated. They're refusing to back down, even though they're being labeled as anti-Semitic and terrorist sympathizers. And their numbers are growing. As the discourse begins to open, more people are starting to understand this as a rights-based issue, not an issue of radicalism. This is a movement for the rights of people whose rights are being denied, who are living under occupation, who want to live in their country freely, just like anybody else. You can see just so many video clips of kids having their hands smashed by soldiers with batons. You can see just so many pictures of thousands of people being killed as happened in Gaza. And at a certain point, you, there's a cognitive dissonance. You realize that what you're being told is a pack of lies. Let's just get away from the mythologies and talk about the realities, and then maybe be able to persuade people that they should not any longer give their unwavering support to a nation engaged in a policy that's not just inhumane and, and brutal, but ultimately suicidal. Given the central role that the United States plays in backing Israel, it seems to me Americans, all Americans, have a right to question particular Israeli policies, and in particular, the prolonged occupation. The fact that the Palestinian people have been kept without a state and without any political rights for decades now. For us in the United States, I think, the issue has to be, what is our government doing? How is our government allowing, enabling, supporting, arming, defending Israeli violations? In the end, this comes down to a battle for the minds of the American people. A battle over the stories they're told to make sense of this conflict. A battle over perception. The more Americans are able to see the reality of occupation with their own eyes, to see images of routine daily violence, of the repression and humiliation that never make their way into mainstream news, the more they'll question the image of Israel as this tiny little David up against the bullying Arab Goliath, and start to wonder if it's actually the outgunned Palestinians who might be the real Davids here. When that starts becoming the dominant perception here in the US, all bets are off. It all comes down to American public perception. That's the one way to change anything, changing perception and understanding here, leading to a change of policy here. As long as the United States supports Israel, nothing's going to happen. The U.S. government will support it as long as the U.S. population tolerates it. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator tonight. He's a journalist and historian, the head of the Tri-Continental Institute for Social Research, based here in the Valley in Northampton and the author and editor of over 30 books, including Letters to Palestine, Writers Respond to War and Occupation. Please welcome the amazing Vijay Prashad. Good evening. Good evening. I'm so glad to be here this evening with you. Before we talk about our event, I'd like to say a few words about the situation in Palestine. For six decades, the people of Palestine have been denied rights of statehood and rights of citizenship. They have been reduced by the cruelty of history to being refugees and an occupied people. The promise of a two-state solution is now largely eviscerated. Settlements in the West Bank, the attrition of East Jerusalem, and the incarceration of Gaza, which is being bombed today, have made any Palestinian state on these territories impossible. Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu has talked about the full-scale annexation of the West Bank. 
That's the contempt shown by the Israeli state toward the two-state solution. The Israeli state wants a three-state solution to expel Palestinians to the three states of Jordan, Lebanon, and Egypt. This is intolerable. A one-state solution, the position with the most possibility, is rejected by the Israeli state and large sections of Israeli society on the basis that it would no longer permit the existence of a Jewish state. Palestinians would be a near majority, and such democracy would be unacceptable in an ethno-nationalist state. So what Israel is saying is that it is content with being an apartheid state, the annexation of five million Palestinians in the occupied territory who will become second-class citizens inside greater Israel. That is apartheid, as a United Nations report noted two years ago. It is a situation we are confronted with. It is a situation encouraged by the United States government, the government of the land on which we will meet this evening. And yet, even with US complicity in an apartheid situation, no discussion is permitted. If you offer anything less than the annexationist logic of the Israeli state, your speech is disallowed. This event almost did not happen. We, the panelists, were charged in a malicious lawsuit with having, as they said, a publicly known reputation for being anti-Semitic and or supporting known anti-Semites. What is the evidence for this dangerous claim which maligns our reputations? Thanks to Jewish Voice for Peace and Rachel Weber, we began a slight journey away from such maliciousness. This kind of maliciousness is faced every day by US representatives Ilham Omar and Rashida Talib. It is what is faced daily by Roger Waters, by Dave Zirin, by Mark Lamont Hill, by Linda Sarsour, and to a much less degree by me. It is what we come here to denounce. We are not backing down. We are not backing down. No way. Not when the stakes are so high for the Palestinian people, who should be the focus of this discussion. This conversation should not be about free speech. This discussion should be about the existence of an apartheid situation in West Asia. It should be about the demise of the two-state solution and the emergence of the apartheid state. That should be the focus of the conversation. But it is not. It is about silence. It is about fear. But we are not backing down. We will not be silenced. We will speak of Palestine and amplify the Palestinian voices that seek an exit from apartheid. So there it is. This is where we stand. Before the panelists come out, it's my absolute pleasure to share a very short video from my friend, the civil rights icon, the radical intellectual, Angela Davis, who wanted very much to be with us. So this is Angela. Good evening, everyone. I am sorry that I'm unable to participate in person in this panel on Palestine and free speech. Therefore, in this virtual format, I want to welcome all of you to this extraordinary event. Despite efforts to cancel it, this panel is still happening. 
We are experiencing a new historical conjuncture in social justice organizing. The demand for human rights and justice for Palestine no longer remains on the margins of our struggles here in the United States. This demand is moving to the very center of progressive political agendas. One cannot, for example, say that Black Lives Matter without challenging the occupation of Palestine and the policies and practices of the State of Israel. The political consensus that calls for support of Israel at all costs is breaking up. Black people, Latinx people, Asian Americans, progressive Jewish people are joining their Palestinian and Muslim sisters and brothers in demanding justice for Palestine. Boycott, divestment, sanctions. This strategy, this nonviolent strategy, which was used during the US Civil Rights Movement, during the anti-apartheid movement, is gaining more and more support every day. And this is why repressive efforts have correspondingly increased. We contest the conflation of legitimate, impassioned critique of Israel with anti-Semitism and the fabrication of a notion that when the left calls for justice for Palestine, when the left supports BDS, then it has become the anti-Semitic left. This indicates a failure to take anti-Semitism seriously, and it reveals the manipulation of charges of anti-Semitism in a way that recalls the McCarthy era and its manipulation of charges of being communist or communist sympathizers or friends of communist sympathizers. If we want to effectively challenge anti-Semitism, we will recognize the deep interconnections and intersections of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. I know all this and much, much more will be discussed this evening. So welcome to an evening of free speech, edifying speech, critical speech, impassioned speech. It's my great pleasure to invite onto the stage Dave Zirin, Linda Sarsour, Mark Lamont Hill, and Roger Waters. Each of our speakers will offer about a 15-minute statement, then we'll hold a panel discussion during which I'll ask some questions. Some of these questions will come from you. You have a card in your hand. Wait to hear what people say before you write your questions down. That's one of the absurd things that happens at events. People write their, at least give people a chance to speak. Pass the cards down to the aisle, and Asha will bring them back, and then I'll read a few of them out. So that's the structure of the event, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, people will behave themselves, but you never know. We're going to start with Dave Zirin. Yeah, Dave. <laughs> Dave Zirin is the sports editor of The Nation, he has a podcast and blog called Edge of Sports. He is the author of 10 books and was nominated for an NAACP Image Award for his book, The John Carlos Story, The Sports Moment That Changed the World. 
Dave. I gotta put this on. That's right there. Got you. Give it up for VJ Prashad, everybody. My goodness, so I get to go first, the person you haven't heard of. Very exciting. Um, but, oh, thank you, Mom. Um, but before I start, there are three things I want to say, uh, just to clear the palate, if you will. Because hearing about everything that's been happening here, I'm ready to burst. Okay, one, there is nothing anti-Semitic about criticizing the actions of the Israeli state. And it is absurd that I even have to say that. Two, there is nothing anti-Semitic about this panel or the people on this panel, and it is damn slander to say otherwise. And in fact, the people up here have been on the front lines of fighting anti-Semitism, especially the most dire threat to me and my fellow Jews, the resurgent white nationalism of the Trump era. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, as a Jew, and you may hear me say that a lot in these remarks, but as a Jew, as someone whose family was stamped by the Holocaust, I will be damned if I'll be called anti-Semitic, especially by a coalition that includes Christian Zionists of the Mike Pence variety, people who love Israel but hate Jews and think me and my children are going to hell come the rapture. And we will not be silenced. The efforts to crush this event in the courts has failed. And honestly, Trying to silence a public event whose message is we will not be silenced <laughs> makes me wonder if these groups are allergic to irony. Now, so let's get started. I, I, I first, I, I have to say that my, my old, very frustrated piano teacher would be thrilled that I was doing a gig with Roger Waters. I just have to <laughs> say that. But I actually want to start by quoting the Palestinian poet Remy Kanazi, who said, to be Palestinian in the United States is to face erasure, it's to face marginalization, it's to face attacks and smears, and to be put on blacklists. And that's an important point because it means that those of us who aren't Palestinian have a moral duty to speak out even when it's difficult. Especially, especially for Jews like myself because the crimes against Palestinians are so often said to be done in our names. Now, it's not easy, as the events here in the last week show only too clearly. And as for me, there have been campaigns to take my job at the nation, and all because I write about Palestinian athletes and the toll that the occupation takes on their ability to do something as simple as play some sports. And I also criticize athletes who travel to Israel and pose holding guns with the IDF. And I think that's worthy of criticism. And for that, they want my job. But I also want to say that what I've had to endure is so minor compared to the people on this panel because they are slandered as anti-Semitic while I'm at least normally just dismissed as a self-hating Jew. Now, let's break down that phrase. I think the great uh, philosopher Larry David said it well, <laughs> where he said, hating myself, sure, but it has nothing to do with being Jewish. Um, <laughs> But seriously, how is it to hate oneself to oppose military occupation? How is it to hate oneself to stand with those who need solidarity for their survival? And do you know what actual self-hatred would look like? It would look like us becoming what we as a people once opposed, to mimic our oppressors from decades past. That is true self-hatred. You know what self-hatred looks like? Our self-hatred would look like us rejecting our history of standing with the dispossessed in order to stand with a state built on stolen land. A country whose prime minister wants to name an illegal settlement after Donald Trump. In fact, if you want to talk about anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is, is when people assume that just because you're Jewish, you must walk in lockstep with the state of Israel. What is anti-Semitic is then the assumption that all Jews support violence and colonization. What is anti-Semitic always 
is letting bigoted politicians like Donald Trump weaponize our faith and act like they speak for the Jewish people as if they give one damn about our community while they embolden the very forces of white nationalism shooting us in our places of worship. No, no more. No more, no more. My Judaism walks with Representative Ilhan Omar. My Judaism does not walk with Benjamin Netanyahu. My Judaism speaks to the best traditions of a 5,000 year history of radical resistance, a tradition that the Israeli state has long sought to destroy from the collective memory of our people. And that is a self-hatred I will never understand and never abide. But what I found is that the attacks against me and my dissenting Jewish sisters and brothers have gotten more right-wing, more rabid, more frankly unhinged. And it's for a very simple reason. They are enraged because a new generation of Jews are not willing to be silent when it comes to Israel. And that scares them. For years, liberal Jews have been in what we used to call the pep squad. Have you ever heard of the pep squad? It means progressive except for Palestine. Yet now, many more people are describing themselves as Jewish anti-Zionists, or jazz. <laughs> so they are leaving the pep squad and joining the jazz band. My children are half Jewish, we call them jazz fusion. Um, now, we now have growing groups like if not now, Jewish Voice for Peace, the students who are protesting birthright. There's even a Jewish pro wrestler named, and I kid you not, David Starr, who talks on Twitter about ending the Israeli occupation. Now, look up David Starr. Now, fewer and fewer of us are willing to be silent, and that should scare those who depend on our privilege, our fear, and our, and our blind loyalty. So now we have this bizarre coalition of Christian Zionists, APAC, arms manufacturers, who are trying to intimidate us dissenters in the Jewish community. And it's important to recognize that what unites them, what unites these disparate forces, is that they see Palestinian life as less than human. Whether in Gaza and the West Bank or the refugee camps in Syria, they do not see Palestinians as worth living. That's what unites them. And as Israel chooses more and more to block with far-right actual anti-Semitic governments in Eastern Europe and Brazil, it becomes critical to integrate the fight for Palestine in the larger project of defeating the right, protecting the future of the planet, rebuilding the labor movement, and sustaining struggles against all forms of oppression. And I want to end with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for one reason, because it's always good to end with a quote <laughs> from Martin Luther King Jr. But I was teaching Dr. King in, in a sports history class and about his alliance with Muhammad Ali. I was teaching this uh, at Montgomery College in suburban DC. And I was reading his speech beyond Vietnam and I felt like it was talking directly to this young generation of Jews. Dr. King wrote, a time comes when silence is betrayal. Some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony, but we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. Perhaps a new spirit is rising among us. If it is, let us trace its movement and pray that our inner being may be sensitive to its guidance, for we are deeply in need of a new way beyond the darkness that seems so close around us. Thank you very much. Perfect. Linda Sarsour. Linda Sarsour is with Empower Change, the largest Muslim led social and racial justice organization in the United States. She is well known 
as the co-chair of the Women's March. She was the lead plaintiff in Sarsour versus Trump. Boy. <laughs> That's where it begins and ends, right? <laughs> Linda Sarsour, my sister in struggle. Thank you. What up, UMass Amherst? I am so deeply honored and humbled to be here with all of you today. Um, I mean, Dave, I already loved you, but now I just love you a whole lot more. I want to thank um, UMass Amherst and the faculty, the administration for standing their ground, um, standing up for the values of this university to protect free speech. I want to thank Jewish Voice for Peace, Western Mass. We love you. I love you. And to my brilliant and bold sister, Rachel Weber, thank you for your courage and standing up for us. I want to thank my uh, fellow panelists who are up here, Mark and Vijay and Roger and, and Dave, for their courage. They don't have to do this. I'm the, palace, I'm the resident Palestinian on the panel, just to be clear. So they, so I have a responsibility to my people. They choose to stand up and be on the right side of history. So I want you to give them another round of applause. Every, everything we say this evening is on the record, even if it wasn't on the record. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that I stand here before you today unequivocally and unapologetically Palestinian-American. I stand here unequivocally and unapologetically proud with the blood of a resilient people that runs and pumps through my body. I am also a proud and unapologetic supporter of the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. Because, because I am trained in Kingian nonviolence, the ideology of Dr. Martin Luther King. I believe in the power of nonviolent means to bring about change. And if BDS was not an impactful and effective movement, they wouldn't be trying to oppose it. Not only do I believe in the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement as a nonviolent movement, regardless of what the opposition has to say about it, it's not just about belief, it's about my right and your right in the United States of America upheld by the Constitution that we have every right to boycott and divest in whatever ways we feel appropriate. So, instead of worrying about the tactics, just out-organize us. And I want to say shout out to students for justice in Palestine in every corner of this country for the bold and courageous work that they do every day. Why boycott divestment sanctions? This is a tactic. This is not an organization. It has been used in the days of the civil rights movement. It has been used to end South African apartheid. And let's be clear about what is happening in Palestine. They will say to me, why are you so obsessed with the state of Israel? Linda, they got countries all over the world who engage in the violation of human rights of people. They are absolutely correct. Countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like North Korea, 
countries like China oppressing one million Uyghur Muslims. So it's not lost on me that we live in a world where there is oppression happening in every corner of the world in which we live. Why the state of Israel? Because as a social justice activist, as a human rights activist, but also as an American, I work hard for my money. I hustle for my money. I pay this government my tax dollars. And as an American, I should be able to decide that my money should go to Medicare for All and schools in Chicago and hospitals in our country. And not to fund, and not to use our hard-earned money to fund an illegal occupation and oppression of a people like the Palestinian people. To fund the largest open-air prison in Gaza, to fund the dehumanization and deprivation and vilification of the Palestinian people, the chokehold on travel on the Palestinian people. So when, I, when you say to me, why the state of Israel, I say, why not the state of Israel? Yeah. What inspires me as a Palestinian is the struggle of black people in America. And what we share with our black sisters and brothers in the United States of America is we find ourselves as Palestinians always trying to figure out how to defend our humanity. I'm tired of telling people why Palestinians like black people in America should be treated with the utmost dignity that they deserve. Not, not because not because they're black or because they're Palestinian, is because they are human and they are creations of God and deserve to be treated that way. We as the Palestinian people have been labeled anything and everything but who we are. We are a people with aspirations and dreams, a people fighting for self-determination and the right to return to our original homeland. We are a people with a rich culture. We are a people that know joy. We are a people that know laughter. We are a people that, as a famous Palestinian poet said, we are a people who teach life, sir. People say to me, the state of Israel was created for the self-determination and the safety and sanctuary for the Jewish people. And I believe that all people, including the Jewish people, deserve safety and security and sanctuary. But what I will say is that there will be no state in this world that will have true safety and security at the expense of another people. What I know as a social justice activist, as a human rights activist, as a solidarity activist, is that our safety is in our solidarity. And that our liberation as Jewish people and Palestinian people and the Arab people is bound up with one another. And if we want to all be safe, we have to see the humanity in one another. Our opposition is fierce. They also got a lot of resources. But what they don't have is morals. They don't have principles. So instead of the opposition, right, this is what I say to the opposition all the time. I appeal to the morals and the values of the people. If you got a moral argument for your stance, then come bring it and see if people agree with you. But instead of appealing to the morals and the values of the people, they engage in ad hominem attacks against people who are truth tellers, people who are unbought and unafraid. And I will tell you as a Palestinian American, 
as a daughter and granddaughter and great, great, great granddaughter of Palestinians, that I will not be silenced. I will not be intimidated. And I will continue to stand strong in my positions. Just this week, this is just a week, because I could talk about the last like 10 years, the last two years, but I'm going to talk about this week. This week, in the state of Texas, a Palestinian-American speech pathologist went up against anti-BDS supporters, went up against the state of Texas, who were trying to demand for her to sign a renewal contract with the Houston school district. And when they said in the contract that she had to sign the contract saying that she would confirm that she would not boycott the state of Israel, she said, absolutely not. And she went to the courts. And today I watched a video of her signing her contract without that clause in the contract. Just this week, I went to Winnipeg, Canada. The mayor of Winnipeg, he don't even know who I am. He probably never heard of me. But the right-wing Zionists got to the mayor of Winnipeg. And he stood up in a little press conference talking about you don't got to cancel, don't bring the lady or whoever the lady is. Whatever they told him to say, he said. And then we went from an event that could have probably had about maybe 200 people to a sold out event in Winnipeg where more people heard my voice, more people heard my truth. Then I was about to deal with this event. And I was like, they took us to court and stuff and all this, I don't know. I was like, wait a minute, hold on. Are we in America? Do we live in a democratic country? Because I think I forget sometimes. And then thank God the judge still remembered that he was in a democratic country. And he threw out the injunction. So I was like, this is a lot of winning for one week. I'm sorry, we, there's a lot of winning happening. the way to convince people of your argument is by telling me how you're going to chop me up into little pieces or how you're going to kill me or threaten me or try to get me canceled from events. I'm just letting you know and I'm giving you some free advice. I'm not even charging. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Try some new tactics. There's a Mexican proverb that really resonates with me as a Palestinian. And it says, they thought that they buried us, but they did not know that we were seeds. <laughs> and so I just want to say to everybody in this room that my first responsibility is to keep my family safe. But I will continue to use my voice continue to stand up for the things that I believe in. And I am willing to do that no matter the consequences. Because Malcolm X said, if you're not ready to die for this, take that word freedom out of your mouth. And I will end my remarks with the words of a woman abolitionist who said her name was Harriet Beecher Stowe. And Harriet said, when you get into a tight place and everything goes against you till it seems as though you could not hang on a minute longer, never give up then, for that is just the place and time that the tide will turn. And my dear sisters and brothers and family in this room, the tide is turning. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Thank you, UMass Amherst.
Mark Lamont Hill. is a well-regarded professor, but also a man who likes books. And if you go to Philadelphia, you should visit Uncle Bobby's. I first met Mark Lamont Hill in our joint long journey to free Mumia Abu Jamal. There is something captivating about the river of justice because it floods and finds us all. Mark Lamont Hill. And I saw what you did with that river thing. <laughs> it is, uh, it's overwhelming. First of all, it's hard to go after them. <laughs> but it is overwhelming to see the response in this room today. Five years ago, 10 years ago, I'm not sure we would have 50 people at an institution talking about this topic, but to see what's in the room today, to see who's in the room today, and to see the level of opposition to the conversation that we plan to have today is, as Linda said, a sign of our success. We are winning, we are moving forward, we are advancing justice, and we will win. Opposition to this event today was not surprising to me. We live in a country where there are always going to be competing claims, there are always going to be debates, there are always going to be spirited conversations about the right side of the issue and the wrong side of the issue. What was unsettling to me, as Dave pointed out, was the idea that because we stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people, that we are somehow anti Semitic. That, for me, was hurtful on the personal level because all of us on this stage have worked so hard to fight anti-Semitism, to resist anti-Semitism, which is a very real thing both in the United States and also around the world. We could even argue in the Trump era that it is expanding and, 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 and moving in ways that we never even saw before because of the evangelical right, because of historically persistent anti-Semitism, because of all the narratives of hate that are, that are being promoted and promulgated in the media, often from the White House. Because of all of that, anti-Semitism is something that we must take seriously. Yeah. We must. Yeah. And as a social justice activist, as a person who identifies as a radical, I don't want to be part of any social justice movement that is transphobic, that is homophobic, that is anti-Semitic, that is Islamophobic, that is misogynist, that is patriarchal, that is ableist. No one is free until we are all free. There is no room for any injustice. So that's why I didn't think I did nothing too crazy when I went to the UN. <laughs> they asked me to come to the UN to speak on behalf of the Palestinian people as a representative of civil society, as a non-Palestinian person. For me, as a black person, as an African in America, that meant that I was trying to stand in a tradition of African freedom fighters who have stood in solidarity with the Palestinian people. I'm talking about Malcolm X. I'm talking about Huey Newton. I'm talking about Angela Y. Davis. I'm talking about SNCC. I'm talking about Ethel Miner. I'm talking about all the freedom fighters who stood up and said we must stand against settler colonialism. We must be unafraid to name it. We must be unafraid to call it out. We must be unafraid to stand in justice and freedom and democracy. We stand in the tradition and 
and we will not be moved. We will not back down. We will not be silenced. So I'm flying back from Palestine. And I was near the river. Jordan River, just, I'm just being geographically specific, just to be clear, I don't want them problems, I don't want no smoke. I'm just, I was near the Jordan River and I was traveling and I flew back specifically for the UN speech. I landed in New York, I went to my crib in Brooklyn, got dressed, came back through. On the flight there, I wrote, now I don't write speeches, but I said, you know what, I'm gonna write this one. Cause I don't want there to be any problems, any controversy. I went and read the previous two years. I think Roger had done a couple. I read your speeches. I was like, oh, shit, OK. There's a whole long line of troublemakers like myself. But I said, I will be specific. I will appeal to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We were there in November of 2018, 70 years after the Nakba, 70 years after the great catastrophe. And also 70 years after the establishment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and what I was attempting to do was say that there is a contradiction between our universal commitment to human rights ostensibly, our universal commitment to making sure that everyone has freedom and safety and self-determination and dignity, and what we see on the ground. When I'm in Khalil, when I'm in Hebron, and I'm looking at children have to go through checkpoints, and I'm looking at the ritual humiliation of being patted and, and, and searched at the age of six and seven. When I'm in uh, Khan al-Ahmar, and I'm looking at this village of, of, of Bedouins, which is about to be torn down after they built schools out of tire and mud because they couldn't get permits. And I'm watching the village be torn down for the sole purpose of settlement expansion when I'm looking on Via De La Rosa as Christians are honoring the stations of the cross. And at the very same moment that they look at their savior carrying the cross, I'm looking at Palestinian children being stopped and searched and frisked in front of the Armenian hospice. I'm looking at these places. I'm looking at second class citizenship inside of the state of Israel for African citizens citizens and for refugees and for people seeking asylum. I'm looking at a place where people have a gap between their expressed democratic ideals and their lived practice on the ground. And they say, well, like Linda said, why, why Israel? Why not Bahrain? Why not Saudi? We, we, I'm out there too. I can't say enough about what's wrong with Saudi. I can't say enough about what's wrong with Bahrain. I can't say enough about what's wrong with the United States of America. And I promise you, I promise you, I'm already criticizing Saudi, I'm already criticizing Bahrain, and, and I'm already criticizing Syria, I'm already doing these things. But the moment a call comes out of civil society from any of those countries for boycott, divestment, and sanction, I will back them too. It's not about isolating Israel, it's about speaking the truth everywhere. So I gave the speech, and to this day, I mean, I gave a 22-minute speech, and we only talk about the last six words. I can, they make you scared to say them. What was it, window to the wall? What was it? I can't remember. It, and there was no critique of the speech or the content of the speech. Just this pretext of a critique of those last six words, from the river to the sea. And the question was, why use those words? Well, for a couple reasons. One, people said it's, a, it's from the Hamas charter. It's also in the Likud statement of 1974, the platform statement. I don't know if y'all got Twitter. That's Donald Trump's press team. They, if you look at Twitter, Benjamin Netanyahu's son last week said that he wanted to expand the Jewish state from the river to the sea. It's just 
fascinating. It's fascinating who gets to use the language and who doesn't. Part of how we police speech is to decide who can have this conversation and who cannot. But let me be clear to you, my dear friends, brothers, sisters, and informants. <laughs> Shout out to the Mukhabarat in the back. We, when I say from the river to the sea, what I am talking about is a free, democratic, self-determined, safe, and just, and equal land for everyone for everyone. That means, that means that we have to care about what's happening in Gaza, which is a human rights crisis. We have to... My people? People from North Philly? Shit, yo, somebody get Beanie Siegel. Somebody call Meek Mill. Hold up, wait a minute. Y'all thought he was finished? When he... Let the speaker speak up, I'm And so... Free, 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 my, my dear brother, I want you to have a space to talk, just not while I'm talking. That's all I'm asking. I respect your right to free speech. I respect your right to have a different opinion in mind. But we can't talk at each other, and so let's have a dialogue. And at this point, just let me finish my words, and then we can talk later. Is, can you agree to that, my brother? Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, just allow me to finish this point, which I now forgot, because I started thinking about Meek Mill. What, what, what are we talking about? Oh, right. So when I'm talking about the river to the sea, I'm specifically talking about the opportunity to talk about what the crisis in Gaza, to talk about what's happening in the West Bank, and to talk about the differential citizenship status for, for Palestinian citizens of Israel. I'm talking about all these areas. I want freedom in each of these areas, and we must be committed to having that conversation. Palestinian freedom does not mean Jewish destruction. It does not mean Jewish marginalization. We can have both. The challenge is that sometimes when you are in a position of power, when you are in the role of oppressor, equality looks like and feels like injustice. Oh my God, men are losing the company. We hired four women. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> we must be committed to this solidarity work. Despite the odds, I can't promise you that if you do this work and speak the truth that you won't be fired. I almost got fired from a university where I have tenure. <laughs> now, think about this. The, the chairman of the board of trustees said that he was morally outraged by my speech. He had never seen or heard anything so disgusting before. He's Bill Cosby's attorney. <laughs> yeah, Google that. I can't even make this stuff up. <laughs> Tenure is under attack. Our jobs are under attack. Our lives are under attack. What we're experiencing up here is just a small piece of the hell that people are catching around the world for speaking up on this and many other issues. I'm not suggesting a Jewish conspiracy. I am not saying that there's a cabal of power conspiring to take people down. Let me be very clear, because that is an anti-Semitic trope and a dangerous one. 
Let me be very clear about that. What I'm saying is that we live in a nation and in a moment we're speaking up for justice, whether it's reproductive justice, whether it's housing justice, whether it's sensible gun legislation, or whether it's ending this vicious occupation, comes at a price. But we are committed to paying that price. We must all be committed to paying that price. Because if we stand up and pay that price together, they cannot get all of us. We cannot all be taken out. But if we continue to divide, if we continue to separate, if we continue not to hold on to the rope, then we won't be victorious. But the, sign is, the evidence is on our side. Yes, it's dark. Yes, they're trying to move the embassy. Yes, Trump is imposing policies that Congress has held back on, although they ultimately supported for years. Yes, violence is increasing. There are many reasons not to be optimistic about this moment, but as Dr. King said, it is only when it is darkest that we see the stars. This room is a star. This room is a bright shining light. This room, this movement, this moment is evidence that we will be victorious. We will win. Palestine will be free. Free the land. Free Mumia. Free all political prisoners. about how he almost lost his job uh, at his university. And I would just like to say very happily that this university didn't hire me. So <laughs> it was even more difficult, perhaps. <laughs> Roger Waters. Roger Waters, Pink Floyd. And Dark Side of the Moon <laughs> saved me from my teenage years. <laughs> I forgot to mention marijuana, but that's another thing. <laughs> that I have to introduce Roger Waters is an embarrassment. Roger Waters. Wow. How do you follow all that love? <laughs> that is a lot of love to come out of three people preceding you when you've got to get up to a podium and, and say something to a room full of people like this. Um, but I will do my best. Um, David Zarin in the green room before we came out uh, here tonight asked me, he said, what happened? How did you get into this? What was the beginning of the story? And I thought, I've told this story a lot, but I'm going to tell it once more, because he hadn't heard it, and he said he thought I should. So here we go. Um, I tacked a gig in Tel Aviv at the Haikon uh, Stadium onto the end of a European tour in 2006, and immediately I started getting uh, emails from um, all kinds of people. But one of the people I got an email from was Omar Barghouti, who two years before had been part of the committee that started the BDS movement in Palestine. Um, they tried to prevail upon me to cancel the show that I was going to do there, and I did cancel it. I was persuaded by their arguments. Um, but I, I came to a compromise, and I moved my show to an agricultural community halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, called Neve Shalom, or in Arabic, Waha Asalam, and uh, which is um, a multi-faith kind of ecumenical uh, community where Jews and Druze and Christians and Muslims all live together with their children and the children all school together and they all um, cooperate with one another. 
and it is uh, an expression of brotherhood and love. So we did a gig there in the middle of an empty um, chickpea field. And it was the biggest gig anybody ever had in Israel. There were 60,000 people there. I was doing the Dark Side of the Moon tour at the time. And the audience took hours and hours to get in and blah, 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 blah. And they spent the whole night going like they do. You know. <laughs> I'm, I've got nothing against that. I love that, personally. <laughs> um, but they did. Um, until we got to the end of the evening, when I said, I stood up in front of all that and said, um, you are the generation of young Israelis who must make peace with your brothers and sisters in the neighborhood and bring in a new era of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and they went from to, what the fuck's he talking about? <laughs> in a heartbeat. And it was one of the most chilling sights I've ever seen in my life. I saw it later in ver various parts of Israel when I went back the next year. Anyway, that is the start of the story. And I went back the next year and traveled all around the West Bank. And it was a chilling experience, even though uh, I was under the protection of the United Nations and a lovely woman called Allegra Pacheo, who worked for UNRWA at the time. Um, I was devastated by my personal witness of the apartheid and oppression and the stealing and dispossession that I witnessed. And so I've been a, a, a small part of this movement ever since those times. Okay, moving on. Um, I was going to talk about Paris in 1948 and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but <laughs> Mark covered all that, so I'm screwed. <laughs> Um, except to say, this is something I say at all my shows now. I say all of you in this room, ev in fact, everyone in the world at some point, comes to a moment in their lives when they have to make a choice. They have to study the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all 30 articles, and they have to decide for themselves whether they subscribe to the idea. Because as we know, it is a fairly modern idea. It's only a couple of hundred years old. But, so you have to ask yourself that question, or you do if you want to have any semblance of being a human being. Uh, and if you decide that you do subscribe to the definitions in, in the Declaration, you then have to decide whether you're prepared to stand behind it or not, as these people on this stage all are, and as I suspect most of you are, because it's fundamentally important to the way that you lead your life from that point on. All right, that's enough about the fundamental declaration of human rights. Um, ten years ago, and this really is a digression, but I don't care, because these three wonderful people on this stage with me have covered everything that I could say about Palestine and freedom for the Palestinian people, and, and have said it probably more eloquently than I could. However, ten years ago, in 2008, um, just before Obama was uh, elected as the President of the United States, I wrote a somewhat rambling poem, and I'm going to read it now. Um, I've since made an album that has the same title, but the poem is, is quite different. It's called, Is This the Life We Really Want? Uh, I felt this poem kind of popping out of me as I drove from the airport today through this bit of Massachusetts and looking at all the clapboard farmhouses, and I, I felt as if I'm in the, in the heart of something that is American here. Uh, so anyway, the concept of an average guy is patently absurd. There's too much differential in the herd. Just look at Bush and Cheney, then look at you and me. It's like comparing Shakespeare to reality TV. <laughs> is this the life we really want? being murdered by these clowns, our children crushed in rubble, are we deafened by the sound of media mouths all moving in apparent unity, spewing out the mantra of the free? Free to plan the neoland, safe in their bomb-proof lairs, free to send our sons to war, our sons, of course, not theirs, 
free to burn and pillage, to fill the family vault, free to claim it's dog eat dog and really not their fault. Fear drives the mills of modern man. Fear keeps us all in line. Fear of all those foreigners, fear of all their crimes. Is this the life we really want? It surely must be so, for this is a democracy, and what we all say goes. We all say, kill bin Laden, kill Saddam Hussein, kill anyone collateral who might get in the way, kill all the dogs and shopkeepers, kill all the coppersmiths, kill everyone who chooses to be on the evil list, kill everyone who doesn't want to be our acolyte, kill everyone who disagrees that what we say is right. It's gonna cost us trillions, already has in fact, but no price is too heavy to keep the faith intact because we believe in freedom, human rights for everyone. Well, everyone that is except the ones we need to bomb. And if some of them are children and seem a bit forlorn, it's not our fault. They should have chosen somewhere different to be born. Anyway, I'm sure they'll all agree it's a success when we've tidied all the insurgents and tidied up the mess. Even though they may be crippled or rotting underground, they'll be happy when democracy is the only game in town. They can help to build our bases. They can wash, wash our fancy cars. They can service all our carnal needs in pickup joints and bars. Against their religion, pff, their religion's wrong. I'm sure they'll get the hang of it, catch on before too long. Then they can all watch baseball, they can build a Disneyland, eat pizza and McDonald's, drink bourbon, start a band. I know, I know, no alcohol. The towel heads don't drink. The fuck, they'll soon get used to it. We'll have to have a think. I digress, I'm sorry. What was my train of thought? Oh yes, now I remember. Is this what we all ought to be devoting our resources to, to spread this rotten creed, teaching their dead children avarice and greed? Was it Truman Capote who famously railed, it's not enough that I succeed, I need others to fail. Is this the life we really want? To set ourselves at odds with every other species, not to mention other gods? I don't think so. In general, my experience has been that ordinary Americans, when asked to cite their dream, conjure an existence where they can raise their kids without the chafe of blowing other people's kids to bits. Is it my imagination? Is it too much to suggest that their leaders over there and our leaders in the West are driven not by trying to achieve peace in our time, but by something else, by something altogether less sublime? Call me a cynic, but it some, sometimes seems to me that some of them are more attached to power than to peace. Just supposing for a moment that they're in it for the cash that they're looking out for number one, building up their stash. What better way to divert the attentions of the poor than an axis of evil and a good old fashioned war? It's economics 101, as every schoolboy knows. War is good for business and diverts us from our woes. It's so unpatriotic to complain about our lot when our brave boys are out there in the desert getting shot. Imagine if the money that we're spending on the war was used instead to rebuild dikes and help rehouse the poor, to research cures for cancer and fund institutes, to delve into ways of helping people less well off than ourselves, to secure our docks and airports and power stations, to prevent the disaffected in our own and other nations from expressing their attachment to some vengeful deity in self-immolation, immolating you and me. Or is it power that gets them, being able to decide how to divvy up the cake, who should live, who should die? To have at their disposal all those sexy tanks and planes. Got you. No, I got you first, reliving boyhood games. Why don't we just stop them? Why don't we get tough, take to the streets in millions, say, enough is enough? Why? Why? It's obvious, because actually, we, that's you and me, that's all of us, because actually we, all the blacks and all the whites, Chicanos, Asians, every type of ethnic group, even folks from Guadalupe, the old, the young, the toothless hags, the supermodels, actors, fags, football stars, men in bars, washerwomen, tailors, tarts, grannies, grandpas, uncles, aunts, friends, relations, homeless tramps, clerics, 
truckers, cleaners, ants, maybe not ants, because it's true that ants don't have enough IQ to differentiate between the pain that other people feel and, well, for instance, cutting leaves or crawling across windowsills in search of opal treacle tins. So like the ants, are we just dumb? Is that why we don't feel or see? Or are we all just numbed out on reality TV? So every time, every time, the roadside mine, the guided bomb, the ricochet, the gatling gun, the tomahawk, the phantom, mirage, RF squawk, the IED, the false hello, the cluster bomb with fries to go. Every time the curtain falls on some forgotten foreign life, rest assured it is because we did nothing to prevent our masters, dedicated as they are not to protection of the weak, not to democracy, that we did nothing to prevent their headlong dash to maximize the bottom line. So what, if anything, to do? Well, understand that every day, in many small but central ways, we get to choose enslavement to the bottom line with all that that implies, dog eat dog, God eat God. Did I mention freedom fries? Anyway, we get to choose, or so we're all led to believe, well, now, in 2008, election year, who knows? It may well be too late, but just suppose, just suppose if we all vote, that we can start to bridge the gap between what we all have become and what we all just might have been. The gap between the blind and blinkered, great unwashed, the laughing stock, the butt of universal scorn and enmity and wrath, and grace, and pride, and leadership, and light, and beacons shining in the West, admired by both the old world and the third. Safe haven for the lauded claims in constitutions written fair on parchment years ago, when equality, fraternity, and liberty were rocks core bedded in an earth emerging from a darker age. I do believe that we can spread our wings, take flight, renounce the darkness of the marketplace, reach out across the iodox abyss, embrace our longing to be kinder, I, and have more fun, and garnish less the moneylenders' nests, and touch and sing and breathe in relish of our new unfettered selves, embrace the law in that we all agree that standard issue kicking in our door, tapping phones, rendition, torture, waterboarding and the rest, the random shooting down on London's underground of someone's nephew from Brazil, however scared the powers that be, are alien to our beliefs, and so should be confined to memories of Hitler's Reich and, of course, to Uncle Joe's gulag archipelagos, so are we babies that we need to be protected, that left unfettered thrashing we might hurt ourselves, that they, the Cheneys, Putins, Bushes, Blairs, and all their spawn and all their heirs, in all their ruinous, bankrupt, fearful crap, that they somehow should have the power to keep us at each other's throats, impotent, straight-jacketed, squabbling over dimes and groats, like infants in our swaddling clothes. Fuck them, enough. They've had their time. A new day dawns, and we will not be swaddled in their grime. Okay, friends, there was a lot of debate about this event, 
And oh, no. one of the shorthand ways in which this event was described, it was called a BDS event. Now, I've been involved in this movement for a very long time. And for years, one heard the statement, why don't the Palestinians do something nonviolent? <laughs> for years, one heard, why don't the Palestinians do something nonviolent? Why are they always violent? So, Linda Sassur, uh -oh. <laughs> what is this BDS movement? Thank you, um, Vijay, for setting it up like that. And I think it's very important, which is why when I said on the stage that I'm a supporter of BDS and the tradition of the civil rights movement and boycott and divestment campaigns that happened way before there was ever a call from Palestinian society to engage in BDS, is because I am trained in Kingian nonviolence. And in fact, I will support any oppressed people in any corner of this world in their pursuit for justice by nonviolent means. The boycott, divestment, sanctions movement was a call from Palestinian society to people all over the world who were looking for ways to support the self-determination and the freedom fight of the Palestinian people. And so what the Palestinian people said to people all over the world, they said, if you want to support us, join us. Get your universities to divest from occupation, from settlements. Get boycott companies who profit off of the occupation of the Palestinian people. And it is a movement that has grown exponentially around the world. And I tell people all the time, the reason why I support students around the country who engage in these boycott and divestment resolutions on their college campuses is because I am proud of any young person who, number one, takes a stand for human rights, and yes, also of the human rights of the Palestinian people, and focuses their energy on powerful, non-passive, non-violent ways in order to bring justice. So I, as a non-violent activist, I support the boycott divestment sanctions movement. And if you don't want people to support the Palestinian people through nonviolent means, give me the alternative of what it looks like to support the Palestinian people. So for now, we're sticking with a nonviolent boycott divestment sanctions movement. Mark? Yeah. I, I, I agree with everything Linda said. Um, and, and, and I think there's also some conversation about and debate about what uh, BDS is calling for and what it's not calling for. Um, let me say a few things about what BDS is. One, BDS is, again, a, a movement that is committed to social justice. It, is, it virently opposes anti-Semitism, uh, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and any other form of inequality or injustice. That's a key point to mention. It is not a religious movement. Um, BDS is agnostic on the state solution question. There are opinions within the BDS movement about one state versus two state versus all sorts of other political imaginaries. Um, but BDS does not have a position on this. Um, BDS is at making three calls. One is a return to the pre-1967 borders. Two, and these aren't in any particular order, uh, full rights and full citizenship rights uh, and equality for uh, what Israel calls Arab citizens of Israel, the, what, what Palestinians and supporters would call Palestinian citizens of Israel, that 1.8 to 2 million people who comprise the citizenry of Israel. And the third is the right of return. These are the three pieces of BDS. And again, BDS is a call, and, and this point can't be reiterated enough, uh, that Linda made. This is a call out of Palestinian civil society. Because the question for me as an ally is why would you, why, why are you doing this? Well, because I support this cause and this is the call out of it. Why aren't you, again, why aren't you looking in Crimea? Why aren't you looking in Tibet? Well, because there hasn't been a BDS call for it. Um, and the reason, and, and BDS does not, one more thing, um, BDS does not target individuals. Although in, in the tradition of South African anti-apartheid movement, it could. Um, but BDS targets institutions, not individuals. It's institutions that are benefiting the occupation, 
benefiting the, in, the injustice against Palestinian folk. It's not individuals. So yes, there are Israeli academics who might be inconvenienced, that, but, it, but the Israeli academic can still come to, for example, if the, the, um, we didn't win, the AAA, American Anthropological Association, did not win our resolution, but uh, the Modern Language Association did, and ASA did, the American Studies Association did. An Israeli scholar can go to the American Studies Association conference. They're not banned. Israeli scholars are not banned from attending these, these, these conferences. They absolutely can, and they're welcome. So academic dialogue and, 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 and engagement is not, for, is not uh, foreclosed upon. I want to talk to Israeli scholars. I want to talk to Israeli academics. The question here is, do we want institutions to benefit from these things? Because at the same time that I want an Israeli academic to have access, I also think about my colleagues at Birzeit, who can't go to a, you know, who can't go to a conference at the University of Haifa, who can't go to a University of Tel Aviv. They can't go to Jerusalem, they can't go to Jerusalem, University, or Hebrew University of Jerusalem, excuse me. They can't attend these places. And so I'm thinking about, those, I'm thinking about academics that have to go through checkpoints and get uh, uh, permits. Yeah, I was trying to think of an English word. Uh, that's why be, be there too much. Um, try, trying to think, uh, who have to get permits to, to, to go to Al-Quds University in Jerusalem. So, so these are the things we're thinking about, but it's important to know what BDS is and also what BDS is not. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it, this is absolutely a point that is never brought up, which is the academic boycott of Palestinian academics. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, not only in the West Bank, but in Gaza. Exactly. Where in Gaza University, people get even Fulbrights and can't come and, and take them. Um, I don't know anything about American football, Dave, but <laughs> I really don't know anything. But I did read up on your writings on Michael Bennett. I had to even look at his yeah. name. Uh, who uh, is from the uh, Seattle Seahawks. Well, and now he's on uh, okay. your New England Patriots. Uh, Boo! I'm an Eagles fan. <laughs> Whooped y'all ass last year. <laughs> well, the Michael Bennett story is a fantastic one because it shows the power of the person who opened tonight, and that, that's the great Angela Davis. Uh, Michael Bennett is somebody who had uh, agreed with other NFL players to go on a trip to Israel. It was all, all expenses paid. It was a trip to Israel. It was going to be NFL players going to Israel. It, was, it, it looked like it was going to be a blast. Uh, he said yes without giving it a second thought. And then a newspaper article uh, came across his, his screen because it was sent to him by people who wanted him to see it uh, that talked about, that, that was a newspaper article from Israel that spoke about how by going on this trip, the football players would then become diplomats, emissaries of Israel itself. And that the trip was going to be closely prescribed so they would see what the government wanted them to see. And Michael Bennett saw this, and to his credit, he began asking questions. And he began posing questions to others who were going on this trip, asking, is this something that we want to be doing? And then he read a book, and it's called Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis. And he started to think about Ferguson, and he started to think about Palestine, and he learned for the first time that activists in these disparate places have been in contact with one another, advising each other, speaking to each other, giving support to each other, giving tactical advice to each other about how to resist things like tear gas. And he started to put himself in the shoes of people in Palestine. He learned about murals in Palestine dedicated to people like Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, and he felt an affinity for the Palestinian people, that was new. And then, and this is one of the benefits of playing in the NFL, he was able to get Angela Davis on the phone and speak to her himself. <laughs> and that was a life-changing moment for Michael Bennett. And he was able not only to confront the reality of the trip, but then also speak to other NFL players as well who backed off of the trip as well. Because they realized that they couldn't say we are for Black Lives Matter in the United States, but somehow Palestinian lives matter less. They couldn't do it. And 
for Michael, I remember talking to him and him speaking about it being like a Dr. King moment when Dr. King said, you know, I could no longer raise my voice against violence in the urban ghettos when the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence throughout the world. It's that kind of moment where you start seeing these connections internationally in a way that, frankly, you cannot forget. And so that's the Michael Bennett story. And you know, since that time, I mean, he's somebody who's, oh, this is the big part. I left out the punchline, which not that it's funny, but uh, what, what happened then was that he came out with a very public statement about why it was that he wasn't gonna go. And he quoted 1968 Olympian John Carlos where, who, who, said, who raised his fist on the medal stand and John Carlos said, you know, there is no partial commitment to social justice. You're either in or you're out. Right. And being in means you stand with the Palestinian people. And, when, and that became a huge news story throughout the world. And Michael Bennett was, was shocked at how viral this went, about hearing from people all over the world. But the, the end result of it, that what he said was, he said, it wasn't the hate I received, it was the joy I received of people who felt like they were actually visible and being heard. And that for him was a life-changing moment. And I just feel so incredibly lucky to have been able to experience that with him because it just showed me as if I needed any other evidence that you know the power of us to create these bonds of solidarity throughout the world are more powerful than a thousand armies. Dave is being really humble, but he also wrote a book with Michael Bennett called Things That Make White People Feel Uncomfortable or something like that. Yeah. So just want to make sure that you don't be too humble now, Dave. <laughs> um, Roger, you know, there is almost no important issue in our current moment that you haven't engaged in some way. I mean, you recently went to Ecuador, and against immense pressure from the government, you were able to go and see where Chevron, an American company, is destroying lands, forests, and the communities of the indigenous. I mean, it's, you know, it's extraordinary that people don't see the width of your commitments. But what I'd like you to talk a little bit about is the important role you've played in asking your, as you said, rock and roll fraternity not to play Israel. Could you talk a little bit about what you wrote in 2013 and then the work you've done since then? What I wrote in 2013? You wrote a piece in The Guardian, and that's where I got this lovely phrase, my rock and roll fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have given me a glance at it before you ask me this question. How am I supposed to remember something from... It's what ideas? moderators do. Okay. Bravo. Um, I haven't had an enormous amount of success, I have to say, speaking to my colleagues, with the no, no, few notable um, exceptions. Um, there is a shiver of fear that runs through the music industry if you mention BDS, certainly in rock and roll, it's most of these. I mean, some of them obviously are like, um, what's he talking about? Because we are divided into two groups of people, human beings, in my experience anyway. There are those of us who are the lucky ones who, are, who experience empathy with their fellow human beings. And it's what makes life worth living. That's right. Is that. There are other human beings who do not experience empathy with other human beings. Your president is obviously one. He, does, he, wouldn't, he has absolutely no idea what that word means. Mm -hmm. and, and in consequence... Yes. All right. You can, there can be a special... Which is one of the things, obviously, that makes him such an extraordinarily bad leader. But that's another matter. Uh, within the music fraternity, naming no names, there are people as well who, who it's missing. They care about the bottom line. There's 
futile scrabble to maximize the bottom line. And if you say to them, yeah, you're going to earn a million dollars in Israel, but what about human rights? What about the struggle of the Palestinian people over the last seven? Can you put yourself in the shoes of a Palestinian father whose child has just had his knees shot through by an IDF sniper? And they go, no. And they can't which is a weird thing. So that's what we should be spending our money on. We should be spending on our money on ways to discover why human beings, some human beings, developed without the spark of empathy, which is the only thing that, in the end, will bring joy to their lives. I mean, that's the line in the poem is this the life we really want? I mean, it's a question of humanity. What kind of human? Um, you know, it's, it's an odd place we're in now in, the, in this conversation. I, I don't, wouldn't say it's just in the United States. I think this is a global conversation. This place where the phrase anti-Semitism is used to quiet certain voices. When, you know, we all understand that they are real anti-Semites in places of genuine power, dangerous people and so on. One of the questions that's come from, from the audience is, you know, do you think Ilan Omar uses anti-Semitic tropes, for instance? It's a question. It's a question. It's come from the audience. I looked at it. I thought this is interesting. Why is this an important question? Linda? I think this is a very important question. We need to have an honest conversation about it. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, and Mark said this earlier when he was on the stage, you know, this idea of calling Mark or me uh, or so many others, I can sit here for days and name other people who've been called anti-Semitic, is actually a disservice to Jewish people. Because what it does is... Now, now, now you, can, you can sit here and say you vehemently disagree with us, absolutely. We have different positions on Israel, we have different experiences, we come from different places, and we could have a spirited debate, and we can all go home and we can say we went to this event and we didn't agree with a damn thing anybody said. And that's okay, because we live in a country, we live in a democracy, we all have different opinions. But when you start calling people like us anti-Semitic, you distract from real violent anti-Semitism in America. When, when anti-Semitism, <laughs> becomes black people and people of color who are the natural allies of the Jewish people who also are black and Arab, let's be clear, too. You, it is a disservice to Jews. And for our Jewish family who doesn't know how to, how to feel about this disagreement on Israel, the question to ask yourself is this. There has to be, a, or, or maybe not the question, but the distinction that has to be made between feeling uncomfortable and unsafe. We don't make you unsafe. We might make you uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm not gonna deny that. Now, so when it comes to Ilhan Omar, we, and I've been in this same position as Ilhan Omar many times, this idea of whether we are using tropes or anti-Semitic tropes. The question is, are there, being, are there tropes being used against us? The way in which we have framed Ilhan Omar is through an Orientalist trope that basically says that we as Muslims are inherently anti-Semitic. So that we got, basically we're anti-Semitic until proven otherwise. We are guilty until proven innocent. So when Ilhan Omar did the first tweet about it's all about the Benjamins. The, 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 the scrutiny and the re far reach and the... It was clear to me what she was saying. It was clear to a lot of people, including a lot of Jews, what she was saying. Dave will say it in a second. We cannot deny that in America, AIPAC and the Israeli lobby have influence on our government. That's just not something that is really debatable because it is very clear to me. So what I ask people 
sometimes is to give people a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Ilhan Omar is a Somali refugee who grew up in a civil war and lived in a refugee camp, the largest refugee camp in the, in the world. And so when people engage in things that you as a person may be offended by, and you have every right to be offended, you have every right to see something and feel a certain way, and your feelings are valid. The question should then be to understand that it shouldn't be a presumption of guilt that she was engaging in an anti-Semitic trope. Let's get a clarification from our sister. Let's understand whether or not she knows or has any idea that she could have been in fact using an anti-Semitic trope. So the reason why there was so much uh, reluctance to join the conversation of whether Ilhan was engaging in anti-Semitic tropes put me in a situation where I said, I see a human being here. I see a woman who has fought for the working class people. I see a woman who is a victim of war. A woman who is in fact the American dream, who comes as a refugee and a black Muslim woman in hijab in, the, in an Islamophobic country and goes to the halls of Congress. That's, what, that's the story of Ilhan Omar. And so for anybody to, 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 to think that I, I'm going to allow there to be a story that an anti-Semitic black Muslim woman went to Congress. Well, you are mistakenly wrong. That is not going to be the story of Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar is a freedom fighter. She is a truth teller. And in fact, she is equal opportunity. She goes after the Saudi government. She went after war criminals like Abrams. She's all, you tell her where there's a fight for justice and you're gonna hear her voice. Yeah. So, I'll end by saying this. Let's dialogue. Let's debate. But to call us, including people like Rashida and Ilhan and folks on the stage, to call us anti-Semitic, in fact, is going to put us in a moment in history where something really bad's going to happen. And people are not going to know who the enemy is, in fact. And we're going to be distracted by the true groups of people in this country that don't want Palestinians to exist, they don't want Jews to exist, they don't want the black people to exist, they don't, they don't want any of us to exist. And in fact, our existence in America as black people, as Palestinians, as Jews, as trans people, as other marginalized people, just our existence is an act of resistance. Yeah. So, and I say this to people all the time, and why I have, and I don't like to say this publicly, because as a Muslim, I believe once you say what your good deed was, it gets erased. So I'm not gonna get into the specifics. But I have shown time and time again as a leader in the progressive movement, what solidarity looks like in action, not just in words, when it comes to solidarity with the Jewish people. It's, it's there. I don't have to do it. I don't have to do it. I don't have to do it. But I do it because it's based on a quote that I have up in my office, in my bedroom, it's in my notebook right now. And it's by an Aboriginal activist and it says this, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because you believe that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I believe that our liberation in America as members of oppressed communities is bound up together. But I will also sometimes make you feel uncomfortable just a little bit when I talk to my white Jewish sisters and brothers. Because yes, you are Jews and you are members of an oppressed community, absolutely, 100%. And that is why we are seeing the rampant rise in anti-Semitism against Jewish communities. But we also have to recognize and my Jewish white sisters and brothers, because there are black Jews and Arab Jews and all kinds of Jews, that there are moments where you can, in for a very temporary short second or two, benefit from white privilege as set out by white supremacy. That's all I said. And I don't say that, I don't say that to remove you from solidarity. I say that to you to recognize that you have a privilege that can easily be taken away from you in one second. And so that when we see right-wing Zionists, particularly those who are Jews and 
visibly Jewish, aligning with neo-Nazis, that the Jewish community has to stand up and say that is not us, that does not represent us, and that our solidarity is with people of color, with Jews of color, with Palestinians, with Arabs, with black people. So that is why you will hear me make you uncomfortable for a second, because your whiteness your whiteness is conditional. Your whiteness is conditional. It is temporary and can be taken away from you in one second. But you know what is forever? You know what is always gonna be here for you? This progressive solidarity movement that we have built is your home and you belong in it. And it won't be whole without you. So don't sit at home trying to decide based on the right telling you there's anti-Semitism in the right and anti-Semitism in the left. There's discomfort in the left, and there's ignorance in the left. And yes, there may be one or two or three people that are anti-Semitic in the left, but for you to try to equate the left anti-Semitism with right anti-Semitism leaves you without a home and leaves you vulnerable, and your security is important to the movements that we're a part of. So think about that. Reflect on that and know that these are the people when the day comes, and we hope it don't come are the people that are gonna put the, our lives on the line for the most oppressed people, and that is also gonna include our Jewish sisters and brothers. Bravo. Yeah, my two tenets on Ilan Omar. Is there anyone in this room who has not watched all four episodes of The Lobby, which was an Al Jazeera investigative documentary should make sure that they go on the internet, find it, and watch them. Further to the Benjamins. Um, you know, when you were speaking, Mark, you uh, talked about seeing very difficult sites in the West Bank. Uh, like you, I have seen similar things in the West Bank. Of course, nothing approaches the situation of Gaza Nothing approaches the situation of Gaza. And you know, the question that I'm going to read to you comes from the audience. And it's extraordinary because rather than reflect on the extraordinary structural violence every day in Palestine, the question we got is, what do you say about the rockets that are being fired into Israel? OK. Um, there are rockets being fired into Israel. Um, that is an actual fact on the ground. I think, though, that it would be problematic and short-sighted and intellectually dishonest to not take a step back and look at the full context of Gaza, right? Because you can't, you can't look at one piece and disconnect it from everything else. No, I... I, I Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Let him answer the that, question. That's, that's your I'm warning. not sure what I said that you, excuse what me. What did I say? Excuse me, please. I haven't said anything yet. I've asked, excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me. I think, I think that's, that's probably already your third warning. So I would like you, because it's a ticketed event, to please leave the auditorium. You know, my, my, excuse my, me, my brother. Can you can you do this? Can excuse you do this? It, it, it's a, it's, it's 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 my brother right here. If would, would you mind allowing us to finish the conversation? I'd rather you stay if you can just not interrupt us as we talk. I understand you might disagree with me. The only thing I would ask is let me say it before you disagree with it. Yeah, exactly. Just you'll let me finish. Please. I appreciate your generosity, please. but please allow me to finish. Please allow me to finish. I, I respect your your point of view. I want you to be able to stay, I want you to be able to listen, I want to be able to have a dialogue, but we can't do that if the moment I grab the mic, you start yelling over me. Excuse me, well, I've, no, it's asked, a panel. The question. It, I've it, asked the a question a... from the audience. Let it's... him answer the question. And... Relax. And so... I... Relax, relax. Can I make an observation, Mark? Yeah. I'd, li I'd like to make an observation here. All of us, all of us, all of us, I'd like to make an observation here, and my voice is very loud. Yeah. Please go ahead. 
I'd like to make an observation. It's very interesting to me that there is many people up here that are talking. But the most, the most opposition, hold on, hold on a second here. The most opposition has been to a black man speaking in this room. So, as, 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 hold on, think, hold on, hold on, hold on. And as, as a, I need, you gotta, you, sometimes you just gotta put it out there. And as a Palestinian American, I am telling you that it's better for you to wait and listen and then disagree. Because you came here already with whatever. Give us a chance to speak and in fact, give the black man a chance to speak in America. I was gonna say that too. I pre I <laughs> See, if I say that, I'm sensitive. You know, I was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I think that I think we have to look at the context of Gaza, and um, when you look at the first, we have to look at because one of the con one of the big arguments is well, Gaza is controlled by Hamas. This is not Israel, and therefore any problems that happen in Gaza are Gaza's own problems. I think that's something we have to look at first. Um, when, um, when Gaza leave, excuse me, when Israel leaves Gaza and Hamas is elected, democratically elected, uh, there is still Israel bordering Gaza by land, by air, by sea, the air electromagnetic sphere, the population registry. It, Gaza has never had a full moment, a, a moment, a single moment of self-determination. Um, that's something that's important to note. Um, many of us who are critical of what's happening in Gaza are also critical of Hamas. Uh, I, I won't speak for everybody up here. I'm critical of Hamas. Um, I think there's often a kind of thing where you have to almost ritually denounce Hamas to have any conversation about the occupation, which I think is problematic. But, but I do, I have, I'm critical of Hamas for many, I'm critical of the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, exactly. In fact, It, it, it's, I mean, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas asked me to come a while back to, to, to do a tour, and I was like, no, because I can't stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people and also support the PA at this moment in history, which is governing without a mandate. So, so I have to be consistent with this thing. I'm not avoiding the rocket question. I'm just trying to give a context mm. for it. Um, so when I look at the conditions of, of employment, when I look at the ac access to potable water, when I look at um, almost every measure of social prosperity that we use in the developed world, Gaza is, 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 is in crisis. Um, Gaza is, there are studies that say Gaza will be uninhabitable in the next 18 months. Yep. Literally uninhabitable. Well, so this is the context. And I think it's too often that we look at the question of resistance um, outside, in, in a vacuum. So to look at rocket fire and not look at the violence of the occupation itself, to not look at the violence of structural deprivation, I think would be dishonest. This is not to say that every act is a righteous one. This is not to say that nothing is terrorism. This is not to say that nothing should, there should, be, should not be a moral critique of anything. I'm not saying that. But to look at rocket fire as if these crazy Gazans, these crazy Palestinians are suddenly lobbing rockets into Israel for no reason, and to, not, and to deny the fact that an occupied people have a, a, not just a natural and human right, but a, a, a right governed by international law to re resist and to, to defend itself, I think is also something that would be dishonest. I mean, uh, I, and this is like, and, and so, I, I know the Excuse applause. me. Excuse me. I, I think I think it's Excuse a great me. question. I, I, I think I, I, I think. I, so the brother the brother's asking. I I uh, I asked the event uh, whatever UMass 
Crowd, yes, please leave. I'm sorry, please leave. All right, so. Please leave, thank you so much. 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 Thank you very much. It's, mm. thank you so much. Yeah, so, and so. Excuse me, I thought you were leaving. I thought you were leaving, thank you. Yes, please continue. Yeah, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I, think, I think we have to have a, I mean, I, I do think we have to have an honest conversation about the, the question of Gaza. And I think we have to have a conversation also about what constitutes terrorism. And I think we have to have a conversation mm -hmm. about the boundaries of international law. I think these are all things that are in the mix that we have to have. But I think, again, and this is the last time I'll say it, I think it's dishonest to have a conversation about rocket fire as if it's happening outside of historical context. I think we have, to, we, have, we have to have a conversation about resistance. And until we do that, I think we'll always be able to frame Palestinians as operating irrational. Again, talking about Orientalist, Orientalist logic, framing the Palestinians as irrational, as barbaric, as uncivilized. When I, I don't see anything civilized about the occupation or about the structural deprivation that's happening right now to Palestinian people. I mean, frankly, from, from my perspective, the United States government has the world's largest military and sells weapons at enormous volumes to the rest of the planet and drops its, let's call them rockets, on people from one end of the planet to the other. And I don't get any questions asking me about yeah. what about the American rockets. And Can I, I just say, I, David? Just to say, I find it remarkable how quickly we forget Operation Cast Lead from 2014. Uh, 400 children, by the, according to the UN, being killed. 1,400 Palestinians being killed. It's just, once again, another example about whose lives are considered worthy of standing up in a crowded meeting and protesting, and whose weren't. I mean, you know what? You can say that all you want, but it doesn't change the fact that you are on the wrong side of history. I'm sorry. And it doesn't change the fact. It doesn't change the fact. It doesn't change the fact that the platform on which you are speaking is a platform made up of the bodies of dead Palestinians. That's the platform on which you are standing. Shame on you. Shame on you. You would be mocked out of my temple. I promise you that. Okay, 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 okay. Let me, let me ask a good question now. Yes, thanks a lot. Thank, my friend. My friend, I'm the moderator. I'm asking questions. I'm not sure who Bro, you are. Bro, just write a question down. We'll answer it. I mean, there's I cards. Promise. You have a card. I if will you personally have... take your question, but just, yeah. just write it down card. so we can have a conversation. Yeah. Yes, yes, write it down. Okay. You're occupying the conversation. <laughs> that line for the next <laughs> wow yes 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 my friend have some manners have some manners don't be so rude let me talk a little bit oh god all right one of the interesting things that the organization students for justice can you ask him to leave please because i think this is just it's just rude. It's just rude. It's very rude. You can have free speech, but we have rules. Don't be so rude. You know what? It's also childish. It's also childish. Although, why should I insult children? Extraordinary. Yeah. Why should I insult children? Extraordinary. Um, I wanted us to talk a little bit about the group called Students for Justice in Palestine. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing 
that when young students on American college campuses approach the question of Palestine, the very name itself seems to irk people. You know, it's, it's, not even, it's before they have an event that they're often asked to be closed down. So I've, I've always found this very peculiar, this whole thing about we're against boycotts, we're for free speech, except if the group is called Students for Justice in Palestine. Then the group must be closed down beforehand. I have a very sincere, nice question here, which is asking us what options should student activists take when they are publicly smeared during pro-Palestinian advocacy? So you should know that we're with you. The three, four of us, five of us on this panel, all the students for justice who are here in this university, who are doing the work now, are taking the responsibility for moving this movement forward, who are trying to spread love and universal brotherhood with all our brothers and sisters all over the world, irrespective of their ethnicity or religion or nationality. That's what you should know. You are not standing alone. When I told my little story about being in Nevi Shalom and finishing the show and going, you are the generation of young Israelis who need to stand up and make peace with your neighbors, it was silence. It was like a steel shutter going down. If I'd said that in an American university here, somewhere in the United States 10 years ago, there would have been a handful of you in here. Now you are many. We are many, yeah. and we will overcome. Yeah. We will give our love to the rest of the world. We will not listen to the naysayers. Um, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, students for justice in Palestine. my love letter to SJP all over the country. <laughs> and you should actually be honored when you are slandered. You should be honored when you are libeled. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because you stand in a long tradition of freedom fighters in this country, many of them students and those of your age, who decided and made a choice to stand up even if they were alone. When we look at many of our leaders now and you look at the Angela Davises of the world, you look at the Diane Nashes, the Ella Bakers, the Dr. Martin Luther Kings, the Congressman John Lewis's and all these folks, you see them as old people. <laughs> Seriously. Because we see them now and today. These people were 17, 18, 20, 21, 22 when they decided to stand up and organize. <laughs> and did you ever wonder with an opposition that is well-resourced, that they would decide to target poor college students. Like, you know what I'm saying? What I, like, this is really something that has been beyond me. The lawsuits, the slander campaigns, the, the, the opposition from administrations, all of this just leads me to one conclusion. You are on the right side of history. And they may not, you may not be loved right now, but I will guarantee you, 20, 30 years from now, people will look back and say, that's how we got justice. That's how the student movement flared up across the country, and it was under the leadership of those who were courageous and brave and committed and joined Students for Justice in Palestine. It's a difficult situation to remember being young. No, I'm just, you know, I'm just speaking atmospherically. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how you became a radical. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, well, ob obviously, um, a lot of this, I think, is, is parental. My mother was radical. So there were always either Communist Party or Labour Party meetings in our house. 
and uh, uh, my mother used to drag me off uh, to British-China Friendship Association meetings at the <laughs> Friends Meeting House in Cambridge where I grew up. And I'll never forget her saying to me one day on the way home from one of these things, where I, as a six-year-old, would sit on the floor and watch grainy films of heroic um, Chinese People's Army fighting the puppet government, you know, and the 48 March and so on and so forth. And um, she said to me one day, you know where we were today, don't you? And I said, not really, Mum. And she said, we were, in the, we were in a place called the Friends Meeting House, which is where the Quakers meet and have their meetings. And, I, and um, I was none the wiser, of course. She said, the Quakers are a religious organization. They're a Christian sect, she said. But they do very good work. And although, as an atheist, I can't subscribe to their religious beliefs, they are very, very good people. And I've never forgotten that. And this, we have to understand that we may not share the same religious or other beliefs with other people, but what is important is to be on the right side of this question and any que question that has to do with human rights and our capacity to empathize with and love our fellow human beings. Great. Yeah. I'm going to ask two of the students from Students for Justice in Palestine Ananya and Sazia to join us on the stage. They have a brief message. My name is Ananya, and I'm the president of Students for Justice in Palestine here at UMass. And before we leave tonight, um, I really want to take a moment to thank a lot of the student organizations that have supported us in these past few weeks. As a student on campus, we have been painted as dangerous to the student community, and that is extremely isolating and frightening at the same time. Um, so with that in mind, I really want to thank UMass Black Student Union. UMass Prison Abolition Collective. Um, UMass Graduate Students of Color Association. And the Center for Education Policy Advocacy. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, uh, my name is Sazi Patel. I'm currently a member for, of the Students of Justice in Palestine group here at UMass Amherst. And I'm going to be the president of SJP next year. So for far too long across the world and on our campus, anti-Palestinian rhetoric has controlled the narrative through which we converse about this topic about Palestine. And no longer is being silent and complacent an option. And so this is why I'm standing in front of you here today and urging all of the students who will be here next semester to please get involved with us. Join SJP, because we need people to continue helping us push this very important work forward. Yeah. Woo. And I want to really quickly give a shout out to all the seniors in our group, especially the dopest president, Ananya. Yeah. Woo. My words. My words often fail me, and they will fail me today again, but your dedication and passion has been incredible, so I thank you for that, and I'm so excited. It's bittersweet, because they're leaving and moving on to bigger and better things, and like I'm like super excited, um, but like the world is not ready for your power, so like let's give it up for them! <laughs> We're going to, we have about 10 minutes more, and I just couldn't resist asking this question because, I mean, it's an interesting matter in dialogues of various kinds. Only certain panels are portrayed as one-sided. It's an interesting thing. 
There are many panels at colleges and universities around the country where, including here, when, for instance, Dennis Ross came to speak here, somehow the imagination is that people who are like that are schizophrenic because they have both sides within them. <laughs> and nobody seems to complain about that. But this panel was asked, why isn't there a pro-Israel speaker? Linda, why is there no pro-Israel speaker? Not that you organize the panel, but I think she might have a nice answer. We are. We're all pro-Israel speakers. Everyone on this stage is a pro-Israel speaker as well. We, we care about the Jewish people and the Arab people who are living in Israel at the time, and we are pro those people. And we want them to have a proper life. We, it must be an absolute misery to be part of that supremacist apartheid state that exists at the moment. Can you imagine the misery of living like that? So we're for them. We want, we want them to be liberated from the situation they find themselves in. As much as our Palestinian brothers and sisters who are suffering more. But this isn't, this isn't bipartisan in the, in the way that a lot of people would believe it is. I was sitting here just now, though, and I confess I wasn't worrying about them and their hurt feelings or their whatever it might be. I was actually thinking, here we are, we're sitting in this beautiful warm room surrounded by a lot of beautiful warm people having a, by and large, good conversation about something that we all care about. In Gaza, they're dying. As we sit here, they are dying. And this is something that we, I, I cannot let go of when, when I'm sitting here in this cozy chair knowing I'm going to get a glass of cheap white wine in about 10 minutes. Well, I hope so. But, you know, this is, the, the, the situation is beyond the most desperate thing that any of us could ever imagine it. I care deeply about the people of Syria. We love deeply. the people of Syria. And the Rohingyans. We care about all oppressed people That's all right. over the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Linda? So I'd like to, I would like to answer the question. I would like to answer the question. Yep. <laughs> Everybody here knows what my position is on the Syrian people. All oppressed people need to be liberated from dictatorships yes. all across this world. So the question, Vijay, that you asked, um, unfortunately, doesn't actually always come from the right place. We got we to, gotta, it wasn't people who were really concerned about a panel that was pro-peace or pro-Israel or pro-anything, really. It's actually a little more sinister than that. The question really is more about I... I'm not a whole human being. And our positions come from people who are so dehumanized that in fact, in order for my opinion, for my truth to be whole, it needs to be validated by my oppressor. And so, if you want to hear another position that you did not hear on the stage today, you have the right to organize a panel with those other voices that you want to hear. And to be quite and very clear, there have been many opportunities and moments and platforms where those who have the position that would be perceived to be pro-Israel and anti-Palestinian have had more platforms than any of us in this room could ever afford. Yeah. And so I am here as a member of a marginalized community with a marginalized voice for far too long. But it's a new day and a new era, and we will no longer be marginalized. And what, what people are going to have to come to terms with, that if you in this country want to fight for social justice and you want to come to the quote social justice movement, when you get there, Palestine will be at the table. And we came here today, and Vijay said this very clearly in the beginning. This should never been a, I should never have to be in any space in America fighting for my right to speak 
about anything. We should have, and I came here today for a very specific reason, to do justice for the Palestinian people. I want the Palestinian people to know that there are Palestinians, generations of Palestinians in the diaspora that will never forget where we came from, that will never forget the blood that runs through our veins, and that we are here with the responsibility to keep Palestine alive because the opposition wants nothing more than for us as Palestinians born in the diaspora to forget. But I will tell you right now, we will never forget. And our children and great, great grandchildren will never forget until there is a free and liberated Palestine. Friends, I want to first thank, uh, thanks a lot. I want, I want to first thank UMass for, um, for this beautiful auditorium. I'd like to thank, I'd like to, like to thank UMass security for uh, what they had to go through. <laughs> I'd like to thank, I hope that you've kept the auditorium clean, but I'd like to thank the people who follow you to clean this place. I want to say that I'd like to offer Roger an invitation to come here to the Mullins Center to play a big concert, which is pro-Palestine. Maybe. I'd like to thank MEF uh, for organizing this event. Mark, Mark, in his remarks, uh, offered us a very important line from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. King said, when it is darkest outside, when it is darkest outside, it's then that you see the stars. And Mark said that this is a star. And in a sense, I feel like our movement now, at this time, because it is so bleak and so difficult, Everybody in our movement is a star. Right. So from the very bottom of my heart, I want to thank the stars on the stage. Dave Zirin. Yeah. Mark Lamont Hill. Linda Sarsour. and Roger Waters. Thanks. Good night, goodbye.